just like taking a snapshot of what's all over the country, mm -hmm. all, especially the original 13 colonies. When we first started researching, we started in 2006. And we're still researching. <coughs> and when we discovered how complicit New Jersey was with slavery. Now, New Jersey was the last northern state to abolish slavery. Okay? 1804 Gradual Abolition Act. The Gradual Abolition Act, you would think, would mean, okay, there's I'm a right that says, I'm free. No, you're not. No. If you were born on July 4, 1804, or after, you would be considered an apprentice until the age of 25 for a male and 21 for a female. Oh my goodness. So you were not free. There were strings attached to it. So uh, New Jersey had a, a lot of skin in the game when it came to slavery, uh, even during the Civil War. New Jersey, with, um, the, the, the cotton would, you know, come up to the northern mills. New Jersey would, you know, put it through the mills, and they were also with the, the all the insurance companies, and 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 you sending leather goods down to the south for the uniforms for the Confederacy. New Jersey has has had their hands in it for a long, long time, and you know when the North tries to act like, oh, that was a southern thing. This no, it was here. By 1800, New Jersey had averaged 12,000 slaves yeah. statewide. So this wasn't just like a passing thing where, oh, well, this is a little bit. They were here from the very beginning. From the, from the when New Jersey was split between East and West Jersey, they were here. They were brought here. We talked about Queen Anne. Queen Anne, when I, you know, Elaine and I were talking during the, the funeral for the Queen, we had really mixed feelings about that because the wealth and the opulence and everything that you see, where did all that come from? Mm -hmm. You know, King Charles now has inherited his mother's portfolio of, I don't know, it might be billions, I, who knows? Where did that come from? The sun never sets over the British Empire. That was set for a reason, because it didn't. Mm -hmm. That's how because they were always colonizing, colonizing, and they were always plundering and taking and taking and taking. They had the Royal African Company. They were supplying the colonists with enslaved people. The more you increased your acreage in New Jersey, mm -hmm. You will get more enslaved people you were entitled to. Mm -hmm. So it was all baked in from the beginning. You mm -hmm. couldn't fail. Mm -hmm. You could not fail because Queen Anne was making sure mm -hmm. that you didn't fail. So now, you know, here you have the Revolutionary War. Okay, so all that. So setting the stage, hearing all this, so now you have all these white founding families here in this region. And you have black families now with the same last names. Uh-oh. What happened? What happened? They were the property of these people, and when they were free, or magnated, or you know, whatever the term you want to use, they had to have a last name. Because they had first names only, for the most part. That's why it's so difficult to trace our history, because we weren't given a last name. We were only given one name. If we were lucky. If we were lucky. Mm -hmm. or not. I have seen wills where it's just this Negro girl, mm -hmm. wench, wench, mm -hmm. 15, mm -hmm. uh, Negro boy, 20. That's the way it was. And now you have people, okay, taking on the last names of their enslavers. But that's, you have to have the last name. So I would go to school with people, and I'd say, hey, that's funny, you know? My last name's Hoagland. You know, my family. I have people with that last name. Mm -hmm. We never thought about it, because mm -hmm. we weren't taught our history. Mm -hmm. None of this history was taught in school. Heaven forbid you even would think about slavery in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Wasn't talked about. If anything, mm -hmm. they would have a little <coughs> snippet in, 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 a, in a textbook that says, <clears throat> oh, slaves were down south picking cotton, and they were happy, happy. and they danced, mm -hmm. and were happy to do it. Oh my gosh. I can remember being in, 
gosh, I think it was in fourth grade, something like that. And you know, with the, the dubious honor of being the only black girl in the class, mm. growing up in Hennington, mm -hmm. Lily White Hennington, and having this um, little, this film about slavery come on and here they have black people picking cotton and then the, ma the next scene you see the black mammy with her head tied up and she's serving the white family and so very pleased to be doing it. Oh, yeah. And she's grinning from ear to ear and all the white kids turn and look at me. Mm. That's the way we grew up. That's the kind of history we got. And I said in the documentary, the PBS documentary, you see it, we were not taught our history. If anything, we were taught to feel shame. Mm -hmm. yes. That's what we were taught to feel, ashamed. Mm -hmm. But no more. These people came here, they survived this. And they came here to be able to tell this story of what we have all lined up against the wall because it was an amazing story. These people persevered and they were talented, they were smart, they were brilliant, and they brought so much to this community. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so. And then we have over here the, um, the property and land ownership. And um, Beverly, just to give them a little snippet of um, Charles Lindbergh, oh. which most oh. people know Charles Lindbergh. And yeah. most people revere him. Yeah, yeah, he was a huge, huge icon. Uh, and um, we all, land ownership is important. People know, you build generational wealth. You, mm -hmm. you, you, know, you lift your family up. Um, the True Heart family was one of the original families. Now, I am a True Heart. Is Pat here? Pat's over at the farmstead. She's farm at the farmstead. Okay, mm -hmm. the farmstead. True Heart descendants. Oliver Hart was a reverend in Charleston, South Carolina during the Revolutionary War. He was sent there as a young man to structure that Baptist environment down there. And he was very, very popular and very skilled, but he was also a big patriot. So while he was down there, he was like mustering up people, like, you know, we gotta break away from these British, you know. And he had money to put behind it too. Mm -hmm. So when the British came to invade Charleston, he would have been one of those people they would have been looking for. Mm -hmm. So when he left Charleston, he took with him a 13-year-old boy. That was my fourth great grandfather. Mm -hmm. It was Friday. Mm -hmm. They come, Friday, they come mm -hmm. north, he brings this boy, he starts to pass through the church. So here Friday is it's new environment, new climate, new everything. In Hopewell. In Hopewell. One, one town over. Right here. At the, at the Baptist at Church. The Baptist, the old school Baptist, Baptist Church. church. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now he has to make his life. First, as an enslaved person, 13 years old. At 13, your mother, you're not with your mother, you never see her again. You never see her again. You never, you, you, you know, your life is now changed. So, Friday is enslaved until he is about uh, 33 years old. And I was always curious as why did that happen? Because in Oliver Hart's will, he specified that. On his demise, Friday would be passed to his son John. And that was very typical of passing people like they were a, a household <laughs> items. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It happened all the time. Oh, a, a, a wedding gift? Take take so and so. Mm -hmm. uh, you need, you know, that's the way. So John was supposed to get Friday. And then there's a codicil. Hmm. Friday will be enslaved for another seven years under the care of my wife, Anne. Mm -hmm. Oh, so there was legislation that said if you were to man, if you were to manumit your slave until they reached a certain age, you had to pay. You had to, there was there was a stipend that you had to pay. So they were going to do it. So they held him until he reached that age. And then they let him go. It was all about the dollars and cents. They had nothing to do with anything. Nothing to do. It was all about the dollars and cents. So while he was still enslaved, he he got married, and they had their first son. And he also uh, had a little cabin up here in the Sourlands, and that's where he raised his family. Um, he became a landowner officially 
around, uh, I believe it was 1816, 1819, it was very, very early on. And what, when you're talking about land ownership, we're talking about land that was deemed undesirable by the white people, because it was called the Sour, the Mountain Sour Land for a reason, because the soil wasn't good, you couldn't grow it, it was huge boulders, you see the boulders, mm -hmm. and the white people didn't want it, it was like, well, give it to the black people, you know. Huh. Um, the Hagerman family, black family, mm -hmm. there's white Hagermans, black Hagermans, the various spellings of the name, but white family family, black family families. Mm -hmm. Black fa family, one of them had 44 acres. No longer, it was lost. Don't know how it was lost, but it was lost. Now how does Lindbergh come into picture? Mm -hmm. Now Lindbergh. Huge deal in the United States. Big icon. Everybody just revered this man. So before the baby was stolen, he wanted to increase his estate. So what was standing in the way was True Heart Land. And he did not like that because he hated black people anyway. Hated. He was a Nazi sympathizer. He goes and, and offers Billy Trueheart, who was Fridays, by this time we're talking in the, in the 19, early 1930s, mm -hmm. offers him money for his land, and, and he says, and Billy Trueheart says, no, absolutely not. This, this land has been in my family for a century, absolutely not. And, and just rebuffs Lindbergh. And then shortly after that, the, the baby was stolen and everything happened, so, you know. But what we don't understand is what happened with that encounter because even though Billy was, he was working for a white family in Trenton and he would come back on the weekends, he never came back. He never came back and he ended up uh, renting the, the farmstead to a white couple, but he never came back. Um, what do you think? We don't know. <laughs> We don't know. We know. We don't know. We don't know. He just he never set foot on the property again. Yeah, but he must have done something. Some businessman that said yeah. no with a gaggle full of money. I mean, he had actual cash money in his hand trying to get this man away from him, yeah. and he told him no. So that's where that article he is, uh, is where it says right up there where it says uh, property land ownership. There was an article written in the Afro American. Uh, that came out of Baltimore, and that story reached them. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, you know, white people aren't going to talk about it, you know. But, the, the, but that story uh, was written about by the Afro American, talking about how old Billy Trueheart rebuffed. I mean, the, to to have the, you know, the nerve. Mm -hmm. You're talking about someone that it was like worshipped in America, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, to say no to him. Anyway, uh, so that was. Uh, Friday's grandson that did that. Yes, yes. Um, so we got so we kind of then move on and give these examples of the people that came on this mountain to make these communities and make their way and and to to really and and, and be part of the American dream. We have men that was living right on the mountain. Here's the Civil War breaks out. First of all, they're not allowed to fight because Lincoln, you know, no. Then suddenly, when things are looking pretty grim, it's like, well, maybe, yeah, okay, maybe we should do something. <laughs> we better reconsider. Okay, okay, yeah, all right, black men. Yeah, let's keep in mind. Yeah. Why would you want to give a black man a gun? Well, they did, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. after you've been treating them so bad, why would you want to give them a gun? So that was one part of it. They were afraid. Yes. So mm -hmm. now the Civil War. So we had a, about 10 to 12 just from this area, just from the mountain, that, that volunteered immediately. And one of them, and, uh, Friday's, another of his grandsons, mm -hmm. uh, Aaron Trueheart, Trueheart, ended up being at Juneteenth. He was there to witness it. With General Granger, mm -hmm. yeah, Juneteenth. Juneteenth. I don't want to see it. Emancipation Day. Texas. Texas. And so that, yeah, uh, that was Aaron Trueheart. That was uh, Friday's grandson. Yeah. And uh, there's another 
Reverend James Skank, he was here, and he yeah. was in the 41st yeah. Regiment. Yeah. But I mean, these people, they saw some action too. All mountain men. We call them the mountain men. <laughs> they saw and some what? action. They saw, they guarded uh, when, when Lincoln went by after he was killed, and he went by his uh, funeral procession. And so the 127th was there to yeah. guard while they were doing mm -hmm. that. And then they just, they just you go see all these battles that they mm -hmm. in the Battle of Alusky in see. Florida, Look it where up. all they thought they killed all the black men. They were just like shoot them down in fishbowls, and uh, these men survived. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. several of these men survived and made it back. Uh, some of them are buried at our Stoutsburg Cemetery, which is just a, a mile. I mean, I, we can walk there from here, uh, and so it's. Uh, a place where those people are buried, these Civil War veterans are buried, there's 10 to 12 of them mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. We have some in Pennington, at Pennington African Cemetery, and they have some stories to tell. They really and truly do. So then they come back and live their lives, and uh, then here we are. Uh, so we have, this, we have this collection <laughs> of, you know, because we just like to, to kind of give a little shout out to who these folks were, and some of their accomplishments, and, and some of the black founding families that they were descendants of. Well, the Grovers were some of the, the you know, the first uh, blacks on the mountain, and this is uh, Wilmer, and this is, so actually, uh, Bessie was the granddaughter of Aaron, the person we were just talking about, that was at Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. So that's Bessie, and they always laugh at her, they're Bessie, you want a little So he had to go back 
time right, right, right at the time yeah, that they were barbarian. Um, was, so that means that I'm married to a barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> She died. Her father died, and another member of the family died. So it's like this this baby at the time he was like three or four years old. The main caretakers of this family, everyone has died. So Jay Hervey and his sister decided they're not raised that way, and they raised my great grandfather. And because I wondered, how is that possible that? Ryder admitted him into their program. It would have to take someone with a lot of money mm -hmm. and prestige who they were not going to mess with. And that would have been somebody like Jay Herbie Stout. Mm -hmm. And so I'm surmising that Jay Herbie said, no, this is what's going to happen. He's going to go to that school. And so uh, Herbert did graduate in 1894. We worked with the, uh, with the archivist at, at uh, Ryder who said, uh, yeah, he was there. We found, we found, you know, his graduation records. We found wow. everything. We found the yearbook. But his picture wasn't in He must have been sick that day. <laughs> <laughs> so, what happened? Why is he dressed like that? Because mm -hmm. for years he would, um, he would pen the documents insurance companies, the banks, wherever he was working, he was, you know, his penmanship was absolutely impeccable. Mm -hmm. And he would write these documents, everything was handwritten. Except he had to do that in a back room, away from the white eyes, because they would have been way too offended to see that the black man was actually writing these documents. Mm -hmm. So he, 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 he did that for a while, and I can only imagine that he got tired of it. And he started working for a family as a farmer, and that's what he ended up doing for the rest of his days. Mm -hmm. He worked for the Pendleton family that owned a big dairy farm, not too far from here. Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, Hop ended up doing. They, were, they called him Hop. And shall we end with my girl? We saved the best. Yeah, we saved the best. <laughs> and who said the article? 
article, the 1880 New York Times article. You can Google it and, and, uh, and read it yourself. January 2nd, 1880, New York Times, Barbarism in New Jersey. New Jersey. <laughs> so we live on a mountain. Barbarian. <laughs> and I'm so glad I was born when I was born because, see, that's a name. If you had called us that name, it would have been on. <laughs> so, my girl, right here. Mm -hmm. And these are ladies, by the way. I thought this one was a man when I first looked at the picture. I went, well, that's a woman. Um, the one with the shawl on, she reportedly died when she was 120 years wow. old. Wow. Yeah, her name was Sylvia Dubois. And uh, Beverly, I'll let you start telling about her. We'll, we'll finish up with her last job. I guess it might have been her last job. I don't know if it was her last one or not, but she sure did it well. <laughs> <laughs> well, based on a book by Dr. Cornelius Larison, he was absolutely fascinated with this woman. He, as a doctor, he wanted to, yeah, to to find out from her what those 120 years were like. You know, what what you know, asking her certain things that she remembered, and, and can you tell me about X, Y, and Z? And um, he would go and, and, and interview her, and then she would fall asleep. <laughs> then he'd have to come back numerous times because well, she's old. I mean, you can fall asleep. I can fall asleep right now. <laughs> so he would go and he and they and, he, and this is her daughter. So he would sit in the bed, and, so, and his and Laris's daughter would sometimes accompany him, and, and she remembered that she wrote the Princeton Recollect of how she remembered her father going to to this cabin, this old rickety cabin in the Sarawans, in in the woods, and how this woman, this old woman, would be there, and he would be talking to her. <laughs> but anyway, so Sylvia, one of the things that she talked about that we find just absolutely fascinating is that what was the name of the book? Oh. The slave who whipped her mistress and gained her freedom. Okay. That's why I said my girl. Yes, she did. Because that's exactly <laughs> what she did. So in her day, now in, in her younger years, she was enslaved. Her mother was enslaved. And, her, and she would talk about how her mother would always um, try to buy her time, which it was a, 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 pro, a practice of an enslaved. And you could buy your time from your master. You could make an arrangement where you pay a certain amount every month. And if, but if you missed your payment, you could you know, be re-enslaved. Re and so she talked about the different masters that her mother had and how her mother uh, was almost uh, killed. Her, you know, she talked about she remembers her mother um, had been very sick. She had just given birth. And that her master wanted her to come outside yeah. and help him hold a hall. And she was so weak. I mean, she was she just giving birth, and how she couldn't do it, and, and in the hall, whatever. And he was so angry that he beat her to the almost to the brink of death. And she remembers, you know, being so afraid of you know her mother almost dying and, and her mother leaving her. Um, how sick her mother was. Her mother eventually did survive. But she talked about that. She talked about being at the hunt house, and the hunt house was where they had the. Uh, the, 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 the strategizing, the, the war council, yeah. mm -hmm. before they went to the Battle of Mama. So she, she was there as this tiny servant girl, and she was talking about uh, the different things that they ate, and what they, she described their clothing, and how they were dancing, and we've had several white historians debunk it and say, no, this couldn't have happened because this doesn't match up. No, she'd have been this this oh. doesn't, you know, this it doesn't kind of match up. Black people only had oral history. That's all we had. People weren't writing down our history. We weren't important enough. Our lives did not matter. So even from the birth of this woman, she did not know. She said she believed she was 120, any, anywhere between 100 and 15 and 120 because she had to match it up to the white child that she was playing with at that time. Oh, I was playing with such and such a time, and it was the time of when the cherries were out, and she would talk about what it was. And then white people would say, oh, wait a minute, that was such and such child from 
the white family, and his age was, and then they, wait, you were playing with him? So they met, so that meant you were the same age? So that's how they kind of, okay, you, you are at least 115 at that time, 115 years old. They said she was 120. So anyway, that was her story about being at the Hunt House. And she and saw look, the marquee. Yeah, she called him the marquee. Lafayette. How did she know there was even somebody mm -hmm. like that existed? Mm -hmm. You know, she said, I saw the marquee, and I saw one of his buttons, and I saw what he wore. And I, mm -hmm. We maintain, you know, okay, other historians, you can say what you want. I, you know, all right, fine. And it wasn't uncommon for slave children to be yeah. servants. Serving. I mean, yeah. young, you know. Yeah. She yeah. was five years old when she yeah. was taken from her mother. Yeah. So. so, I mean, yeah. that, you know, it's like we maintain that she was an illiterate woman. So how would she know that? How would she even know there was these names that she was kind of mentioning, but you know, talking phonetically, you know, what she saw and mm -hmm. who she was. But yeah, that was Sylvia. She ended up, she ended up, um, I'll tell you how she got her freedom. You go to this. <laughs> oh, well. She ended so, up being free. <laughs> yeah, so she ends up, she was in Flagtown and she's with the, um, uh, Dubois family, and they had her and took her up to the Susquehanna River through the beach woods and, and took her across. And she was a ferry person. She would ferry the people across the Susquehanna. This woman was strong. Very strong. And I mean, the other people had the job and they would do what they wanted her because she would get you across and go back and get some more people. Anyway, she actually walked there because she had to take the cattle and she drove the cattle up to Susquehanna River and across, and they had a tavern. And this woman, the uh, Dominicus de Bois' wife, kept beating her and hitting her. And keep in mind, she was just a young girl. She was, you know, maybe, 14. Uh, yeah, 14, 15. I have no idea exactly how old she really was. And here she is. This woman hits her in front of a whole room full of bar room full of people because I guess she didn't do something right. So she hit her in the back of the head with a coal shovel. And this lady died with the dent in her head at 120 years old. That's how hard she hit her. So Sylvia had had enough. <laughs> Once again, I say it, my girl. She beat that woman senseless. And the other people in the in the Barbara and they were like, and she's like, okay, who's next? And they're like, not me, not me. <laughs> That's my spin on the story. So, come to find out that the, um, the uh, slave master, he wasn't there, but when he found out what had happened, he told her, he said, you better get going. He gave her her pass, he freed her and gave her a pass, and she made her way back here. She, she like I said, she would ferry herself and, and ferry people back and forth across the river. She came down that Delaware and made her way through the Sourland Mountains, which yes. it's, this is a very scary mountain. I advise you yeah. to get out of here before it gets dark. You'll be <laughs> crying for your mother, I'm telling you, right now. And that woman stayed in those Sourland Mountains and made her way back to Flagtail. And uh, so then we, we hear stories about her, uh, was that her grandfather that owned the, the Henry Putnam. Yeah, there's Henry Putt's Putt 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 Tavern, Putt and Tavern. somewhere, yeah. I point this way because it's somewhere in the woods, not far from here. Mm -hmm. And that tavern, people came from all over. They came on the train. Quite scandalous. Up. Yeah, they came. They came from New York. They came from Philadelphia. All kinds of stuff were going on. They had cock fighting. They lots had of liquor. Lots yeah, of liquor. Lots. And she made the best peach brandy. Yeah. Here, but, yeah. And so they had, you know, all kinds of good stuff going cock on. Cock fighting. Everybody was drunk. Yeah. And so <laughs> Sylvia, guess what her job was? At the Tuts Tavern. She was about to. Oh. <laughs> 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 one legend they say it was reported that Sylvia de Blois could knock a man out with one punch. <laughs> <laughs> That's my <wonderful>. Yeah. <laughs>